Good morning, soul. My name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here. And this is my kid, Zion, um, because my wife's talking to somebody, <laughs> uh, which is a good thing. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at Soul, like I said, and I just have the opportunity this morning to introduce uh, to you somebody you may be familiar with uh, named Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, Chris is a, is, is a, 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 I'd say, a vital part of our community here, involved in a number of ways. Um, but what you do vocationally also intersects with the soul community. And uh, vocationally, you work for World Vision. And so Chris is not just like the World Vision rep who shows up, shows up to Soul Sanctuary when he wants something. <laughs> he is Chris, the World Vision rep, but actually Chris, whose home church is Soul Sanctuary. And I think that's pretty important. Anyway, Chris, uh, you're going to just uh, take us into the next moment here. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Good morning, everyone. So every year, World Vision Canada recognizes and celebrates remarkable Canadians for their passion and their work to make a positive difference in the lives of vulnerable children through what we call the Heroes for Children Awards. One of these awards is the Reverend Dr. Ken McMillan Award, which is named after a man who was well regarded in World Vision Canada spaces as our minister at large who served with World Vision Canada for 26 years until he retired at the age of 90. Reverend Dr. Ken McMillan demonstrated Christian faith in action, a heart for leadership, a commitment to the church, and care for others, and a heart for children. As a result of that, we created the Ken McMillan Memorial uh, Heart for Children Awards. And this year's recipient in 2022 is Reverend Dr. Jerry Machelski. And this was, let's give it a, give him a hand. We had an opportunity to present this award to Pastor Jerry earlier this year. And today we want to celebrate together as a community, together as a soul community, as we present this award to Pastor Jerry. Pastor Jerry, would you come join me, please? Let's give him a hand as he comes up. Oh, man, this is going to be hard. <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> First, we'll get you set up, and then, and then we'll go into this. So, Pastor Jerry... For this Heroes for Children Award, today we celebrate you. You have so evidently demonstrated a heart for faith in action, a passion to bring attention to the needs of the globe, both here at Soul Sanctuary and in the church at large. We know you have a heart for kids. We see this Sundays here at the church, and anyone who follows any of his socials know that his grandkids better than your own, thanks to his weekly posts. I've had the opportunity to see your love for children lived out globally, specifically in Kenya. Your care and heart for the children we serve was deeply evident, as well as your care and love for those who God has entrusted you to care, to care for these children, our volunteers and our mission staff who serve these children globally. We see your heart for people lived out in many ways globally here in our city, including with new Canadians and refugees and through living word in Iswatini, in Indonesia, in Brazil, and in Kenya, where over 330 children and their families are receiving the benefit of care as a result of your leadership at this church. And of course, dear to your heart, the people of Ukraine. Pastor Jerry, we are thankful for your faithfulness, your servant leadership, your genuine care for our community at here and at home and at the world, in the world at large. It is my great honor to present to you, Pastor Jerry, the Ken McMillan Heroes for Children Award. Thank you. I have a mic. We did the Chosen series. We remember we went through Matthew and we challenged us to go through daily stages of what people around the world were going through. And then we 
did something new. Instead of us going and choosing a child to sponsor, I preached a message and then invited you to respond. And I remember sitting here at the front with you, and I was scared to death. I was saying to myself, like, like we both were sitting in this room. We didn't want to go out there. We didn't know if there'd be three we're, people we're, in line. We're going, if, if, if you missed it, you got to Google Chosen on YouTube, Chosen Soul Sanctuary, watch the video. And, uh, but we were, I was scared to death. Like, they were going to fly me to Africa, and we were going to do this thing where the kids pick the, the volunteers. I said to you, what's, like, how many do you need to make it worth it? Like, and of course, you know, Chris is the perpetual optimist. If it only takes, you know, Oh, it's only one, Jerry. It's worth it if it's just one. Well, no. No, it's not, Chris. Like, are we talking 15, maybe 30? And then that day, I think we walked out with 150-some-odd kids. And uh, it's not me. It's you guys. It's you guys giving of your substance, your heart, your devotion, to know that you can make a difference somewhere else in the world. And you may never, ever see it in your lifetime, but in your after lifetime, you will be rewarded. To which I say thank you. Let's give Pastor Jerry a round of applause. I know you've just bounced that back to all of us. <laughs> and to be honest, um, your inspiration is why we're here today. And uh, congratulations, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that very much. Well, I'm here to talk about Ukraine. So let me start off by saying good morning, saints, good morning, sinners. I'm also looking for a few partners that will join Sharon and I uh, this upcoming Saturday night at Living Word Temple. It's a fundraising banquet. Um, at, and so November 5th at 6.30, or sorry, at 6 o'clock, just here in our atrium. I am inviting you. So if, uh, I would love to have six people join us. And uh, I am not the greatest of going up to people and saying, hey, look, at, I'm going to a fundraising banquet. Would you come and join me? Because I know usually what the first response is this. And so what I'm asking is that will you let the Holy Spirit speak to you? And maybe you don't know Sharon and I, and maybe this is even your first time here, but you're going, I want to make a difference, and I want to help out, and I want to get to know these two. Um, would you be our guest? So I'm asking for six people at the end of the gathering to approach me, to approach Sharon, and come and be our guests. Come and hear what we're doing at Living Word Temple uh, in the inner city here of Winnipeg, and come and help and make a difference, all right? And even if you are saying, I'd love to come, but I got nothing to give you, will you just come? Come and be our guest. That's my prayer. So I'm here about the Ukraine. The joke in staff is, are you going to get through without crying? Right, Andrew? Right, Andrew? <laughs> Not at all. You know what I found out? I, I've, I've tried to figure out what's wrong with me. And I've said this before. I said, I can't figure out why I get up in front of people and I start bawling my eyes out, especially when I shouldn't be bawling my eyes out. I'll address that a little bit later. But then I had to do some searching throughout the scripture, and it was Jeremiah who was the weeping prophet. And... Uh, it's interesting, the things that set Jeremiah off. Number one was the lack of religious and faithful devotion of the children of Israel to God, but also the injustices of the world around him. And I wonder if that's my trigger. Now, I'm not Jeremiah at all, but I'm trying to figure out what's going on in my head. And without question, the wear and tear of the war in Ukraine has left the church in a great need of encouraging word. And uh, this was the reason why I traveled there a few weeks back. It started uh, with me meeting Pastor Sergey, our missions partner in the city. He's from the, uh, the city of Lutsk. And him and I met up in Vienna. From there, we drove to the city of Bruno, Czechia, the Czech Republic. And it's there where Sergey planted a church just uh, about four months ago. And uh, in this church that's only four months old, there's already about 80 people. Most of them are all displaced Ukrainian refugees. And he said, listen, will you just come on this at this church on Sunday night and you can preach and you can encourage them. 
And they were given another, uh, their space by another church that meets in the morning. And you'll see pictures going up as I'm speaking as we go through. And so I spoke, and I, the, the theme of my, my speaking to this group of about 60 to 80 people was, where is God in the storm? Because they all have these storms. They all have these stories. And the biggest question I was finding, I was being asked, is where is God? Where is God in the war? Where is God in the authorities? Where is, where is God? And how is He showing up? We closed that evening with uh, prayer and communion. And I have to say, uh, we actually had real communion and not these little rip back, t- you know, <laughs> things that drive me crazy, but I still understand why we're using it. Yeah, because I think in Europe they don't think there's COVID anymore, but that's a whole other story. It was a fabulous time. The next day we drove to Prague. Once we got there, we toured the city. We connected with a local family who was actually key leaders in, in Sergei's um, uh, church. Uh, they help Pastor Sergey. They actually own a camp where we have taken our own people to do uh, kids' camp and English camp. Uh, just fabulous people, fabulous leaders there in Prague, and they're talking about planting another church there as well. The next day we went to Warsaw. So we flew to Warsaw from Prague, landed in the Polish border city of Jeshuf. Okay, Jeshuf. Now, it's spelt... R-Z-E-S-Z-O-W, but it's pronounced Jeshuf. So every time I'm hearing all these names, I'm just, I am totally lost. I have no clue what's going on. And there, you know, so we landed, and then uh, somebody met us from uh, Sergei's church, and they drove us to the border, which was about, uh, just, a, it took us about two hours to cross the border itself, never mind the drive to the border and after the border. And that night, we finally arrived in the city of Lviv, and uh, again, this is typical Ukrainian travel. We changed cars, and we took another vehicle for another two hour, two and a half hour drive uh, north to Lutsk. So, needless to say, it was just a long time. So, a lot of my time was spent just being on the road and traveling. The next morning, I woke up and I went to Lutsk University, where we spoke before, when uh, Gordon Giesbrecht and Rick Weeb. I believe Rick, you're back from your holidays. Did I see you today? Oh, they're back. Welcome back. And uh, Sharon and I spoke at this university, and uh, of course, it's a, it's a gateway into the, with the church and building churches community. So I said to Sergey, do you want me to go to the university? And he said, yeah. And, and, and I said, okay, well, tell, tell them what they want me to speak on. And so they said, well, you'll have two classes of students and one class of professors. And they gave me the topics. But the first one was the one that stood out the most for me. And it, the title was, How to Be an Active Citizen. Now, you can Google active citizen, and it's right in front of you, but basically, what's our role in society? What's our role in civics and, you know, elections and being aware of what's going on and, and making a difference? And it was beautiful because I asked the question, am I able to, uh, uh, you know, share my faith? Because that's the motivating factor behind. And, of course, I got the green light on that. And so this first class was my highlight. And I was able to talk about all of our mission projects from Living Word Temple to around the world. I got to show them the chosen video of what took place and we pushed you know, world vision. I was able to mo- share what motivated me, which was my faith. And I was able to talk about Ephesians 2.10 uh, and actually expound on it that we were all created by Christ Jesus to do good works prepared in advance for us to do. It was awesome. It was a highlight of my morning. And people are crying, and you could tell the Spirit of God was there. And I just got to share. No altar calls, just to share. The next two sessions were a little bit more technical with the topics they gave me, but it was still encouraging them. And I, that's everywhere I went, I said, you need to know that there's a group of Canadians that are behind you, that are praying for you, that are encouraging you during this time of struggle and war. And of course, that was awesome. Then the next day, though, was probably the most difficult time for me of the trip. We got up very early that morning and we made our way to visit four places. Names that will probably be synonymous in your head if you've been watching the news. Bucha, Hostomal, Irpin, and a little village called Advika. These were the places where the murder, torture, and abuse of citizens by the Russian army was first discovered after they were pushed back by the Ukrainian army. And as we drove, we we came to the place of where the Russian army was halted. 
And it was a place to destroy tanks and armored personnel carriers. And up to this point, everything was surreal. Up to this point for me. As a person who's never experienced war, who could never figure out why my grandparents were always a little hesitant to talk about it, it was here at these tanks that something went on inside. There's, it's interesting because I posted it, I think, on my social media. Pastor, come here. We've got to show you something. Come here, come here, come here, come here. So, of course, they stop the vehicle. We get out, and I see all the, the destruction before me. And you go and you walk and you look in and you know full well that whoever was there, their ashes are the only thing that are remaining. And the crazy thing says, Pastor, come up here, let's take a picture. So Now again, I'm in a different culture, so this is a key component where this is where the evil was pushed away. And so now we're standing on this tank and I think the picture of me smiling was like, eh. Like I couldn't, I couldn't really rejoice. I can understand their enthusiasm. But... It was, it was one of those awkward moments that just started working in my head. And then we started to drive through the cities. And as we started to drive through, there were so many... You can go to the next slides, guys. Unnecessary destruction. I have picture upon picture. Just flip through these real quick, please. They're all the same. Picture upon picture of unnecessary destruction. We had bags of groceries in our vehicle. We had bags for adults and we had bags for kids. The purpose was they were there taking me to the areas where they have made connection with survivors. And I use that term fully. And there we were able to talk with people and hand out groceries and we heard their stories. We stopped to hand out a bag to, to one gentleman when another woman... You can take those off, please. Guys. Cameras. Not yet. Not that one. Not yet. Put me on stage. <laughs> we uh, heard the story of this man and how... saw a video of his close circuit where he almost lost his life due to a rocket. And this woman asked us, and she had her kid in the stroller with her, and she said, what are you guys doing? And we, of course, began to tell her what we're doing. We're here to handle groceries. We're here to make connections. We're here to follow up with people. And she invited us to her house. In the process, she began to tell us the story of the invasion from her point of view and everything that happened to her and the terror that they went behind. And I'm not going to share those stories because of the fear of Maybe you went through your own stuff. This is not the time. I don't want Sunday morning to be a time. That you relive memories. But as we gave her a bag of groceries and gave her, little, her daughter some fruit and some candy and a toy, she invited us to see what was left of her house and where she was currently living. We began to share her story. Her name is Nina. And Nina was that family that was on the screen there, and again, more kids would come out of the house, and there's a series of eight or nine people living in a house of now about 400 square feet, because her house was burned to the ground. So you pray for people like this. We kept driving, and there was villagers on the side of the road. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, you, you lurch forward in the van, and if you've driven in Ukraine, you know exactly what I'm talking. Somebody likes to hit the brakes really hard, and everybody pales out of the van, and then we go across the street, and we start talking, and we talk, and we're bringing groceries, and we're hearing more and more stories, and then people in the neighborhoods are walking out, and they're seeing what's going on, and they're coming, and they're asking, and we get an opportunity to talk, and we get an opportunity to pray, and I always ask one question, especially with the, the picture before with Nina, I asked her after she told her story, I said, how are you doing emotionally? Everyone I asked this question, even all these older folks in the, the previous picture, how are you doing emotionally? Bar none, all of them would look off. Look away. 
start to cry and shake their head. Every response. So it was interesting because at that point in time, we said, can we pray for you? And we would lay hands on them and we would pray for them and we'd ask for the peace and the healing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the key thing about the church in Ukraine is that they keep going back to the same places because they've already made connections. And I have story after story. If you want to invite Sharon and I over for coffee, I'll gladly tell you what those connections are. But they would go back and make and solidify those connections because it's just not randomly doing a humanitarian. It's it's building people. It's pouring into people. It's it's healing people. This is uh, the next picture of Adam and Sasha. These people are fantastic. They lost their home. They sold their apartment in Kiev. They moved to the outskirts in a little town called Advika, and they began to tell us a story on the day of the invasion. It's amazing. They are non-believers, but she reads her Bible. Sasha goes, no, I don't believe. And I'm, I go, yeah, you do. I go, Through a translator, I can get smart. I'm like, yeah, you do. Yeah, I just heard your story of how you escape, how you were trying to save your own skin, and then you decided to include your family, and then 17 people in total because of the neighbors saw you leaving, and how God opened the doors for you to actually escape. Tying red, uh, white armbands on their arms, driving in their cars with their arms outside of their cars so that they're not blown up and shot at. Going to a roadblock, and the officer at the roadblock says, what are you doing? They said, we would like to leave. We want to leave the town. He said, no, get back in there. So they go down and they basically do a quarter block around and they go up to another gate post. And there's another soldier there. And he says, what are you doing? And he said, they say to him, oh, the guy at the other post said we could leave, but we have to go through yours. And so, of course, he goes, go ahead. (laughs) They were able to get out. 71 of their own villagers did not. And every one of them had a story. They were able to get back in. They took me to their house. At their house, we poured through the wreckage of the, where the rockets came. They were in the basement of the house. For whatever reason, this is where God was on her life. This is just amazing. They're in the basement. The rockets are flying. They get the sense, we got to get out of here. Let's go next door. And they get out and they go next door. And sure enough, a rocket comes in, takes out the wall of the house, takes out the floor of where they were in the basement of the cellar. It would have killed them. Like it's just, it's just amazing. And of course, at that point in time, they realized they had to get out. That's when they fled. They came back. They didn't have a house to come back to, but there was this old place that had no running water. It was literally falling apart. But they started planting potatoes. And what they decided to do is, we have absolutely nothing left, so we're going to help the people that we're with. And so they are farming potatoes, and they're passing out potatoes. So we go and we visit them. And... Uh, I hear all the stories. And one of the things I did is I took $25,000 cash over with me. This was my friend. This thing never left me. (laughs) It's one thing to have 45. It was a whole other thing to have 25. But you know what I'm saying. I felt rich. Look at me. So, of course, as soon as I get to... Meet Sergey. I give him 24, I keep 1,000 on me. That's how I work, because I have translators that I, I bless, and then there's other issues that I feel with the Spirit leading me. And we're sitting hearing Anna and Sasha's story. And then I look at Sergey and I type, and I show him a little message, and I go, I want to give them some money. Because, again, they don't have any running water. They, they brought out this beautiful cake, and they gave us tea and coffee. They served what they had. And... Uh, he goes, yeah, okay. And I go, well, so how much? He goes, oh, 150, 200. I go, no, no, no. 250? I go, no, no. Three. I do this to him. And he looks at me. That's a month's salary. Think about it. And that actually goes even further now that nobody's working. So he says, yeah, wait. Wait until we leave because he doesn't want her to be embarrassed. Cultural stuff that goes on. So we get up after hearing all the stories. We get up. And uh, Sergey calls me over, which means give her the money. And so I, I try to do a Pentecostal handshake. You know what that is? When you put money in the hand and you, you try to put it in her arm, you know? Well, she's standing there like this. And again, remember, in, in Ukrainian culture, women don't hug men, okay? So, which is why I want to move to Ukraine. Um, 
But, it was just, but although if you would have saw me this last trip, my hugs. I became a hugger. That's my confession. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who are huggers. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, she wouldn't open her hand. I had to literally force her hand and stick it in there. And I said, this is coming from people from you. So sanctuary, people in our church who have given out of their pockets to bless you. And you, you take this money and you spend it on yourself. I don't care what you do, how you do it. You spend it on yourself. You do something for yourself. And if there's anything left over, because I know what you do in your community, I know that you feed your community, you then spend it on your community. The crazy thing was, we were in this big van, and the van is from Colville, which has a rehab center, and uh, so we had a lot of extra space, and she said, uh, before I gave her the money, though, she said, oh, we got something for you to give to the other displaced people when they come to the church to pick up groceries and things. She gave us five bags of potatoes. So here's somebody, these people are on the verge of every little nut, but she's still giving, hence I wanted to give $300. So I give her the 300, she loses it, she cries, whatever, we go. We're driving, and she's friends with Sergei's wife, and this is the contact, so this is our key contact in the city of Advika. She messages Katya, she says, the man that Sergei brought gave me money. She says, you wouldn't believe it, but $100 of that will go to give us running water in our house. Another $100 is going to go for the surgery of her grandmother, who desperately is an emergency surgery, but they had no way to pay for it, for her ears and hearing, and then the rest she can use on her community. It was a perfect amount of money. And of course, here is, is this woman who God is working in her life. And uh, again, like I said, we had stories upon stories upon stories. And needless to say, the ride home was very quiet and reflective for me. Because I've heard stories of horror and abuse of what the Russian soldiers committed. And I would have to say to you in Canada that the term genocide is an accurate term to describe what has happened and what is happening. The next day we drove to Lviv. It's where I did a seminar with about 100 leaders from multiple churches all over western Ukraine. And it was a great time of fellowship. It was encouragement. At the end of the day, Pastor Igor from Lviv took me outside down the road, and he showed me one of, his one of the vans that we helped purchase. And it was being filled with supplies right there. That next day, it was going to Lyman. Lyman was just the city that was liberated. And they're, they're in there. As soon as the, the Ukrainian army's through, like a day after, they're already in there. And um, this would have been uh, getting close to their second trip of going in there. Got back to uh, Lutsk and Sergey gave me a little walk through. I want you to watch this video. So Sergey, tell me what we have here. Uh, here in this room we have clothes, we have shoes, and in different room we have medicine, diapers, and food for the children. And also downstairs we have food, and we make food packages. So in this clothes we give, before every day now we give like Tuesday and Wednesday, so people know about this, they're coming. They make documents because we need to register everything. Right. So it is. Now it's mess, sorry, because uh, Monday they make clean everything, put in a nice way, and Tuesday and uh, Tuesday and Wednesday people coming and they have like nice ones. So here you can show. You have baby you have food and diapers in here, right? Yes. yes. So looking after the kids as well. There we go. That's awesome. And how many people help you uh, any given day? All oh, yes. volunteers. Altogether, we have 130 volunteers. Mm. But when Tuesday coming and Thursday, it's around four or five lady. We don't need so much. But when we give food packages, we not just give food. We organize like coffee, tea for them, preaching gospel. So this day involved around 25, 30 people. That's fabulous. Thank you. Welcome. It's interesting that uh, all the churches are, are equipped like that. Like, you know, the, the place that they rent for their main gathering, this is all upstairs where they have all the storage. But on the main floor, when you walk in, it's a series of mattresses because they just turn it into a place where people can crash. 
Katya's personal cell phone number, Sergei's wife, got out somehow. She doesn't know how, but they knew. People know that Katya will get stuff done. Woman calls, coming out of um, her son. Says, are you Katya? Yes. Well, it's just me, my daughter, and my backpack. And we're on the train, and we're in Lviv. Can you help me? And it's the middle of the night. So Katya phones Pastor Igor in Lviv and says, look at there's a woman and her daughter, and they have a backpack, and they're the only ones at the train station. Can you go get them? Pastor Lee Igor goes, him and his wife, they get up, they go, they pick this family up, they bring her back to the church, they make them sleep, they give them food, they, they help them out. And then the next thing was that they have a camp out in the Carpathia Mountains where all these women are going to with their kids, and so they get her in a car and driving out for four hours. And it's, he's, Igor goes on and tells a story. He says, for four hours, that woman kept asking the question, who are you and why are you doing this? Who are you and why are you doing this? They would answer her questions, but she's in such shock that she can't believe that people are being so warm and so inviting and so okay. And that was the church at action. Who are you and why are you doing this? That's where your donations were going. Paying for gas, paying for food, paying for supplies. In some cases, we raised money for salary, but that's where your donations were going and used in a phenomenal way. The next day was a Saturday. I was able to participate in a wedding, and I simply hung out with a bunch of leaders. That night, we drove back to Lutsk, and it was Sunday. Now, Sunday started off pretty interesting because I was told when I first got there, if you hear the air raid sirens, they're going to call you, and, and uh, you know, you're going to have to go to a bunker. And I thought, okay, that, that's fine, because before I left, I said, I don't have to worry about anything, and I was told, no. We're surrounded by NATO anti-aircraft systems. We're fine. We haven't heard sirens for a while. <laughs> okay. So I get into my hotel, and I look out the back window, and right away there's a building there, and there's sandbags, there's anti-tank things, and I'm just going, hold it. I'm in a hotel. That's a, that's a, that's a target. I'm pretty sure that's a target. Armed guards walking around the building. I'm taking pictures. I'm sending them to certain friends, kind of you know, documenting my thoughts as I go through. So a week later now, it's the same place, same hotel, and the air raid siren's going off, and I'm waiting to get messages, I'm waiting to get phone calls, I'm being like, I don't know what to do, I'm a visitor, I don't, <laughs> I don't belong here. So nothing's happening, I look outside, and, and life is like, like normal, and so I go down into the hotel, I go for breakfast, and it's open, I go, I sit down, I open up my phone, I start going through my stuff, I guess it's fine, this is, you know, I was told, oh, it happens all the time, we just ignore it. Okay, no problem. That was Sunday. We go Sunday. I go. I preach, and uh, yeah, yeah, nothing happened. It was it was funny. You know, I I felt like when in Rome, do as the Romans, right? Here we go. So it continued on as normal, and uh, went to church. And not only did I hear stories of God's transformation in people's lives, I visited uh, or I met a young woman who we first visited in in jail back in 2018, who is now a believer. And so Jordan and I were in prison with this young lady, well, not with her, but we visited her in prison, and she is now involved in the life of the church. And I spoke that Sunday morning on thankfulness in tough times. We went to Sergey's house that night. Katya looks at me and goes, do you hear that? And I go, what? She goes, the alarms, they're two kilometers from a military base. So the, the sensors are going off. Of course, I'm oblivious. And I said, well, are we, should we be concerned? She goes, no, nah, it happens all the time. Well, Okay, great, awesome. Next morning. I'm supposed to leave, but we're going to go to a wedding first. Get up, I want to go for breakfast. And of course, I hear the air raid sirens again, and you're not paying attention. So I go downstairs, and all of a sudden, I can't get into, I can't get into the kitchen. I don't know what's wrong. I guess it's closed. It's Monday. I guess they don't work Monday. I don't know. And I look around. There's all these people in the lobby. I'm not paying any attention to it. Go upstairs, get my jacket. I'm a little frustrated. I'm going to go to Uno Cafe because they make some great food and great coffee. I'm going to go to the cafe. So I start walking over to the cafe. There's a sign that says, air raid warning, please stay safe, Uno Cafe. All in Ukrainian because I had to get the Google Translate out, right? So, okay. And then I, now, I'm, now I'm bugged because I'm told you don't have to worry about it. So I start walking down the streets. And I'm looking for a coffee shop, but there is no coffee shop open. Nothing. As a matter of fact, the banks are closed, the stores are closed, the street's deserted, and I'm walking down the street going, what is going on? I'm not thinking. I am so selfish in trying to find a cup of coffee. I kid you not. 
so then I see something, and of course it's a, a little kiosk, and they, uh, <laughs> they only take grivna. I didn't have any cash on me, and I thought, oh, forget this. And so I start walking around, and then it dawns on me. Something's not right. <laughs> so I go back in. I go back into my room, make my way back to the hotel, coffee-less, make my way back to the hotel, turn on the TV, open up my phone, and I realize all these cities are being bombed. I get picked up right away, and they say, how you doing? I, go and I tell them my story of selfishness. They laugh. And they go, Katja says, oh, by the way, there's still 17 drones flying in the sky above us. Or 13, 13, 13 drones. And I'm just going, you're kidding me. And we're going on the, like, it was just a surreal moment. But this is what they live with every day. We go to the wedding. We find out later that uh, both Koval and Lutsk, their air defense system took everything out. Those are the two cities that weren't hit on that Sunday, that first Sunday. So it was just, it was crazy. That night we decided uh, we were leaving the country. And that was a whole Mission Impossible ride of itself. Uh, three vehicles late at night, exchanging baggage <laughs> at the border, going to the border, talking to the border, saying this is the Canadian that needs to get out. Six kilometer line of traffic that we jumped to the front of the queue. It was nuts. Our driver couldn't get us out because red, the red alert took place and Pastor Andrew from Colville had to arrange another thing. And he met this couple who used to live in the city of Lehman who were going to be our drivers. And here I am in the backseat of a car with Pastor Sergey, and we have no clue who we are with. And we're trusting these people. We ended up spending time with them, hearing their stories. Uh, his name is Sasha. Her name is Julia. And figured out that the reason that he was able to get us out so easily was that he was a, basically he was a reeve of a community uh, in Lehman. So he had all the political, all the government authority to get us out with no problem. And he got us to, to uh, Warsaw. Also, Pastor Sergey and Katja are going to be ministering to this couple just because of what they're trying to do and helping people in the Ukraine. That's the Coles Nose version. I want to encourage the church I went brave. I went not knowing what to expect. I went and I heard, I saw, and I smelt things. And that forever left me changed. And again, I can't share in a space like this. And in spite of the horror of war, and the fallout all around it, that we have no clue what it's about. I want to mention that I'm thankful that the Bible has some very clear encouragement and instructions for all of us, even here in Canada. The words come from Paul, who often identified himself as a soldier of the Lord because he's imprisoned for preaching the gospel. And you can argue that Paul was a prisoner of war when he wrote to the church in Philippi, the book of Philippians, and even there, he, he, was, like, he was encouraged. He was busy giving encouraging words. And the Bible would have us to remember, especially as people enduring difficult days, three simple truths I want to give to you. The first one is, even in difficult days, God is always at work. I saw that firsthand. Paul had a different life situation than we have. And instead of a difficult war in the Ukraine, he had a war of personal proportions in a variety of small, different little prison cells. He had known chains, he had known locked doors, forced travel, insufficient food, poor health. He had been stoned, he had been whipped, he had been beaten, he had been the target of multiple execution attempts. And as if the physical punishment and imprisonment had not been difficult enough, some of his fellow preachers were saying very hurtful things about him. And as Paul refers to all those difficulties, he, he puts things in a wonderful perspective. As for the hurtful messages against him, Paul said this, he said, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether it's from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. There's a story of a preacher who got a nasty letter. He read it through and then he sent it back to the church member with a note attached. He said, 
The enclosed letter came to me a few days ago. I'm sending it to you because I think you should know that some idiot is sending out letters with your signature on them. You know, sometimes that's our world. One of the most important attitudes we'll ever possess is the optimistic belief that God is always at work. You know, we did life uh, growth track this morning and we talked about choosing joy. God is always at work. And we choose joy. I saw people deliberately choosing joy in hard times. In the midst of the most difficult of circumstances. And Paul was able to see his imprisonment as a way to share his faith with the Roman guards. We see that in, in, first, uh, in, in Ephesians 1.3. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everybody else that I'm in chains for Christ. The message of Jesus was moving throughout thousands of soldiers employed at the palace guards. Why? Because Paul was being faithful. The message of Jesus is moving throughout the kilometers of Ukraine. Why? Because the local church is being faithful. In the midst of a difficult war, it's vitally important for us to remember the good that has been done because of the war. People finding Jesus and hope testimonies. In the midst of very difficult circumstances, we have to have the faith to believe that God is at work when it's difficult around us, that he's advancing his, his purposes. And Paul was completely convinced that difficult things happening to him were serving God's purposes. And to be truthful, he probably had his doubts, but he had enough faith, especially in those difficult days, to believe that God's hand was at work anyway. And I think we have to do the same. We're not fighting a battle over there, but we fight and rage our own wars here. Remember, God's hand is at work in your life. Secondly, our faith in Christ should lead us to courageous living. Paul knew that his imprisonment would be his last, and he spoke openly of the possibility that it might be. He said that his, his, his life was to be poured out like a drink offering. He, descri- he basically debated the value of living and dying. And the more important thing Paul knew would be his attitude in the face of a life-threatening situation. I love what author Harold Kushner had to say as he reflected on the end of his own life. He said this, I have no fear of death because I feel that I have lived. There is no way to prevent dying, but the cure for the fear of death is to make sure that you have lived. Paul lived. He had given everything he had for the cause of Christ. And after the beatings, after the execution attempts, Paul's body must have wondered how much punishment it could take. He was whipped five times. There had been hundreds of scars on his back from just those punishments alone. And through it all, Paul still lived for Jesus. He had let it be known that the scars were for the gospel. He let people know that. And he saw those scars as a way to promote the message he loved so dearly. And as Paul lived with such passion, he he came to fear death less and less. In fact, he came to look forward to the day that he would die and even long for it in some respect. Once his fear of death was diminished, he was able to live ever more boldly for Christ. (coughs) Sorry. You have to ask, and well, I ask myself. Would a soldier in warfare be of much value if they were simply too frightened to fight? If they cowered in a corner while the battle raged? Would they contribute to victory if that's what they were doing? And the answer is, of course not. Only the soldier of any value to his country is the soldier not afraid to risk their life when the time comes to actually fight. Theologian G.K. Chesterton said this, the true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. I'm not here to debate pacifism and all of that, although I've been invited by CMU to speak on one of their radio programs regarding peace and peacemaking in the next few weeks. I said, I don't think you want me as your host, (laughs) or as your guest. We had a great talk. But I heard the stories of people who were driving down the highway and seeing the rockets going in front of them and they still were on a mission to help others in the name of Jesus. So let me put it this way. 
wherever the battle finds us, fi- finds us, let us fight our battles as if we're not afraid to die. I think that was modeled to me in Ukraine. They didn't pick up a weapon, but they were at the front line as soon as the town was liberated to provide supplies and s- prayer and to share the gospel of Jesus and give them hope. As Christians, let us be reminded that there is no need to fear death because the battle is already waged on our behalf. And before the day of dying comes, let us live with courage. People, we need courage. More likely, you won't have to face any dangerous situations in Ukraine, but you might face a battle of your own right here at home. Perhaps, perhaps, think about it. Maybe it's time to speak out on social issues in your community or in our nation that might involve writing some courageous letters to your elected representatives. Even more frightening, perhaps your voice needs to be heard at your place of business or at your school or where you spend your leisure time. Perhaps your family needs to hear you speak up about godly values so that you could be... You know, well, I would say this, maybe if you did that, it would be nerve-wracking, but in fact, if you choose to go against an ever-increasing unbiblical culture... Sooner or later, courage will be a prerequisite. Your faith in Christ, however, should lead directly to courageous living. After all, it was Paul who wrote, to live is Christ. We have a message. And finally, difficult days put a greater premium on unity. Unity is a desirable trait in any group, and when young army recruits learn to march, for instance, when you think about it, the unity of the boots stomping on the ground together is an incredible sound. The unity of the march becomes representative of weeks of boot camp training and a sign that the, the, the troops are becoming a single unit. You put those same soldiers on the ground in combat, and the idea of unity multiplies rapidly. It's no longer important to march in unison and to look sharp on the parade grounds. Sudden, suddenly, unity is the key factor in staying alive and winning the battle. Unity means clear communications from intelligence to the commanders, from the commanders to every branch of the armed forces, from communication squadrons to fighter pilots to medics to office personnel to soldiers on the front line. And so unity is simply an option for a country at war. It's not an option for a country at war, sorry. Unity is a basic necessity of life. And so Paul turns to the army of Christ And said, in effect, if you ever hope to win a culture war and make a difference in your community, you can't escape the call for unity. Think on these words. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one of the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Remember, this is the joy passage, the joy letter. Therefore, if any of you have encouragement from being united with Christ, If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one in mind, and so do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We live in a day of great difficulty with the promise that more difficulty is coming. Ephesians 6.12 reminds us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And a church must remember its calling in these days. A church must remember the importance of unity. I'm not saying this because I feel there's disunity in our community at all. Not at all. I'm just telling you what I feel that the Spirit is. 
telling us. And I've witnessed firsthand numerous churches in Ukraine working together to help those in need, sharing the love of Jesus in the midst of terror and a storm. And in Ukraine, people are more open to the message of Jesus than ever before. Did you know that there are over 10,000 Ukrainian refugees in our province alone right now? In Ukraine, in our province, people are looking for answers. They are looking for comfort. They are looking for hope. And we as well have a message of a hope that Canadians also need to hear. Can I be a Pastor Adam and say, do I get an amen out of that? And as you read the encouraging words from Paul to the Philippians, it's impossible to miss the comfort Paul himself had because of his faith in Jesus. Through his death, he knew his death was imminent. And so he writes Philippians, the most joyful of any of his letters, and certainly of eternal life, gives this priceless assurance that, the, that comforted him even in his most difficult situations. He was going to live for Jesus until his death gave him a far greater gain. And that kind of assurance is still available for us today. <coughs> Excuse me. We're moving to communion. And it's all about Jesus. That's basically my report in a nutshell. And like I said, if you want, Sharon and I would love to hang out at your place and talk. Just contact Allison and book a time. Today, if you're a guest here, we're thrilled that you're here. What we're about to participate together in is an ancient tradition. It's filled with emotion, it's filled with meaning, and, and huge theological significance. In other words, we don't take it lightly. And so if you would like to receive communion this morning, we practice what is known as an open table. We just ask that you are a believer, that you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And in a few moments, I'm going to ask you to stand, not now, but in a few moments, I'm going to ask you to stand. And it's quite easy. You're going to exit to your right. All right? So you're going to exit to your right. You guys are going to exit to your right. You two rows are stuck. You're all going that way. You guys will exit to your right. You guys will exit to your right. I made it clear because this is always confusing. Uh, you'll return. You'll go to the stations. There's three people back there. There's two stations here. And they'll provide you with the elements. And then you will approach back through the left to your seat. So just keep it low so we're not bumping into each other. For parents of children K-5, to five, I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. Yes, I'm pointing you out. We'll be praying for you as you leave and acknowledge that. But uh, I ask that you exit the sanctuary at these doors right here where Piper's waving at me. And uh, you can move right now because your kids are waiting for you. You pick them up in the atrium, and then you'll be coming back through this door, and you'll be served over there by Pastor Beth. So you can uh, get a hold of your children. Again, parents, it's your responsibility as you guide your children in communion. So for the rest of us, before we move, will you please stand? We're going to allow the parents just to move a little bit more as they pick up their children. Dwayne and team is going to begin leading us in a song. So please, as they begin to sing, make your way out the right, go to the specific table. You guys are going here. You guys are going up and around to the back. You guys are here, around to the back. You guys and around. Let's move. Let's sing.
we sing that first verse one more time. First Peter 2.24 says, He bore himself our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Because by his wounds you have been healed. Romans 8.3 says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his son, his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in according with the riches of God's grace. And finally, in 1 Corinthians 11, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You may have a seat. Everything we have is in Jesus, and he gives it to us. And he has provided this celebration that we call the Lord's Table, Communion, the Eucharist. It's a table that is centered around Jesus and He asks us to remember. And He asks us twice. He emphasizes it. And so how do we remember? Well, there's a number of ways we can do that. And one way is that we look back to see what Jesus has done for us. We look back and we realize all the things that He has done in my life, that He has forgiven me, that He has given me a second chance, that he's restored my life, that he's helped me in my situations, that he's brought healing in my body, that he's been there for me when other people even have walked out of my life. So we look back, folks, look back to see how good God has been. But we don't stop there. We look within. And so communion is a time where we examine ourselves within, where we should be praying, Lord, if there's anything in my life that's not pleasing to you, if there's any, you know, something that has been, where I've been disobedient or, God, I feel far from you, I've drifted away from you, God, will you forgive me? Now's the time for that. With the elements in our hand, we look within because of what Jesus did and the way he made, and what he did to make a way for us to meet with him. And we remember that what we are doing, it's about Jesus. It's not about our good works. It's not about our do's and don'ts. It's about Him and the price He pays so that we can have a relationship with Him right now. And so whatever has happened in the past or even this week, and you may feel like you don't deserve it even right now, that's okay because none of us do. He's the good, good Father we sing about. He's the God who is. And so we look back, we look within, and now we look ahead. Jesus is our Redeemer. He is our healer. He is our hope. He is our everything. He is coming back again. And we can trust that with all of our hearts. And that's what we do when we receive communion together. We look back, we look within, and we look ahead. And so let me encourage you to embrace this moment right now. This is your time to have an encounter with Jesus. And this experience we do together to remember Jesus as the church and it's the heart of the church and when we do this we acknowledge the fact that he's coming back again and I'm praying it's sooner than later Father we thank you for the bread we thank you for your body we thank you for what you did for us we thank you that there is healing we thank you that there is hope that there is strength we thank you that you put us back together again because on the night that you were betrayed, you took the bread, you blessed it, you broke it, and you said, this is my body. So, Lord, we receive this and we 
think in remembrance that we're looking back and we're looking within and we're looking ahead in remembrance of you today. And so we take this bread in Jesus' name. Let's participate together. And the same night he took the cup, he lifted it up and he said, this is the blood of the New Testament and the New Covenant. This, this is forgiveness. This is the new beginning. This is the fresh start. This is in... This is the difference in eternity. This is what he did. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the blood that was shed for our sins. And, Lord, I thank you that we say again that we need you, Jesus, that we are nothing without you. And across church life, no matter what has gone on, we thank you, Father, that there is forgiveness of sin. And we pray right now that you would lift the shame, that you would lift the guilt, that you would lift the heaviness off our life, God, because because of the blood of Jesus. So lift it. Lift it in Jesus' name, I pray. And let's take the cup. Let's be thankful that it's lifted off our life. So do you need prayer? I know I do. Corey Ten Boom said, I've experienced his presence in the deepest, darkest hell that men can create, and I've tested the promises of the Bible, and believe me, you can count on them. If you don't know who Corey Ten Boom is, there's a thing on your phone called Google. Read her story. I've not walked in an actual battle, but I've seen, I've heard, and I've smelt the after effects. And I have to be honest with all of you this morning. Oh, you're good. She gets a raise. I'm having trouble processing my experiences. Because my brain doesn't know what to do with it. So... I want you to know that upon request of my wife and my kids, who think I'm crazy anyway, but that's okay, but also the leadership of soul, I'm going to be going for counseling to help me deal and process much of uh, what I experienced in Ukraine. And I know I'm not alone, okay? Uh, there are many of you here today who also need a touch from the Holy Spirit in your lives because of your stuff. I just want to be transparent in front of you. And I want you to know that uh, our leadership has the best intentions for me and my family. Last couple Sundays, I've really felt the presence of God at the end of the gathering. And I don't want to create something that's not there. I just want to be obedient to what I felt God put in our hearts, my heart. Which means throwing curveballs at my worship pastor and worship leader. But I've asked Dwayne to lead us in a song just simply entitled Healer. I'm going to ask the prayer teams to move to the crosses. Because if you want somebody to pray for you today because of your own personal battles that you're going through, I want it done before you leave here. That you could leave your burden at the cross. And all you need to do is tell them your name and your request and just let them lift you up with prayer. Or maybe during the song that we're about to do, maybe you just want to take some time and to sit and pray. Or maybe you want to pray with your family or the person that you came with and that's fine. If we ever lived in an hour where the presence of trauma and anguish has been plaguing so many, it is now. If we ever need the therapeutic presence of Jesus, the wounded healer, again, it is now. 
So can we take a few moments before I dismiss you with a blessing? Can, can we not rush out of here and just dedicate some time to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us? Will you stand with me? Father, I just pray today 
for the church in Ukraine, for the church in Russia, for the church in Syria, for the church in Jordan, for the church in Ethiopia, for the church, God, in South America. Father, there's conflict all over this world. And your children just need the empowerment of your spirit to go and to be the messengers of hope and healing. So do that, Father. Send your spirit across the waters. But God, we'd ask that you'd send your spirit upon us here too. May we be your faithful children and may we just share our messages of hope, our messages of healing, our messages of where you are connecting in our lives. Soul sanctuary. In ancient times, the one who blessed extended his hands for a blessing. Those receiving a blessing did likewise. Soul sanctuary. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes. May the love of God be reflected in your hands. May the wisdom of God be reflected in your words. And may the knowledge of God flow from your heart that all might see and in seeing believe. Be blessed. Now go and live the church and make a difference where God has placed you. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.